point of reference He spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of light And as you speak A hundred billion galaxies are born The vapor of your breath, the planets form. If the stars were made to worship, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you've made. Every burning star, a signal fire of. If creation sings your praises, so will I. God of your promise, you don't speak in vain, no syllable empty or You have spoken, lost nature and science follow the sound of your voice. And as you speak, a hundred billion creatures catch your breath, evolving in pursuit of what you If it all reveals your nature, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you say. Every painted sky, a canvas of your grace. If creation still obeys you, so will I. Good morning. Good morning. You know, when God calls you to preach, he puts an itch in your heart that you just can't get rid of. And, you know, I, I thought, I was like, hey, I'm going to enjoy these two weeks, you know, getting to hear some good preaching. And, and I did. I did enjoy it. But the whole time I was sitting there, I was saying, boy, I wish they'd sit down so I could get up there and say something. And as I was getting ready for this sermon when I was preparing, you know, thoughts start running through my head. And I, I, I went in this direction, and I thought, well, this is, this is going to be perfect. This is exactly what I need to tell them. You know, there, there's one problem with that line of thought, that train of thought. It was, this is exactly what I need to tell them. You know, I wasn't seeking God in what I needed to tell you this morning. You know, and, and I realized that, and I stopped, and I said, Lord, you know, these are your people. They, they need to hear from you. They don't need to know what Josh Garmany has to say. Because what Josh Garmany has to say is of no value. So, so I started praying and I said, Lord, I, I need to know what you want to tell them. And he said, Josh, he said, I want you to tell them the same thing that you tell them week in and week out. So I want you to tell them that I love them, that I'm pursuing them, that I died on the cross for their sins, and that I will forgive them. You know, that's really the only message we have, right? If you're called to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, that, that's, what you're, that's the only message that you have, is to reveal Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world, to proclaim the good news that he has come into the world to save sinners such as me and you. You know, that's why we came to church this morning, is so that Jesus Christ may reveal himself to us. 
You know, we were back in my office, and we're going to have communion later. And I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, open our spiritual eyes so that we may see you. You know, that, that's what we need to do today. That's why we're at church, so that we can see Jesus Christ, so that we can feel his presence, so that we can know that he is here with us. So as I spent half my week preparing for a sermon that was headed in the wrong direction, I spent the other half of the week preparing for the one that was headed in the right direction. And we're going to be in John chapter 6, but we're going to actually start in verse 22, but I'm going to give you a backstory of what has, has been going on, what has been taking place. And Jesus and his disciples, they crossed over the Sea of Galilee. And he had been healing many people along the way. And him and his disciples, they go up on a mountaintop to get away. And Jesus there, he, I, I believe he, he sits down and he's, he's teaching his disciples. He's talking to them. And as he's sitting there, he, he looks up. And he sees a crowd of people coming his way. And he looks at Philip and he says, where can we buy food to feed all these people? Now, you know, this is kind of a trick question because Jesus knew what he was going to do, but he, he just wanted to see what Philip would say. I think sometimes Jesus puts us in a situation, he wants to see how we're going to react. Are we going to have faith in him? Or are we going to... Run, scared. And Philip, he answers and he says, Lord, 200 denarii would not be enough to buy the bread that it would take for all of these just to have a bite. I, I guarantee you at that moment, Jesus is going, oh, ye of little faith. You know, if you look up the denarii and everything, that, that's probably, he's talking about about six months worth of wages. You know, he threw a pretty good sum of money out there. He says, Lord, we ain't got enough. There ain't no chance we're going to feed all these people. Well, then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, he, he steps up and he says, hey, there's a, there's a boy in the crowd that has five loaves and two fish. He says, but what is this? What is that among so many people? You know, Andrew, he kind of started in the right direction. Like, hey, we got this right here. But then he says, but I don't think that's enough. Jesus says, hey, tell, tell all these people to sit down in the grass. And we, we see Jesus, first of all, acting as the good shepherd, right? He sees his flock coming towards him, and he says, they're going to need fed. There's this grassy spot here, and he says, have a see it. You know, just like in the 23rd Psalm, he says, lie down in these green pastures. He maketh us lie down in green pastures. He says, bring me the, the five loaves and the two fish. And he gives thanks to God, and he breaks the bread, and he breaks the fish, and he, he disperses it among the crowd. You know, it says that he fed 5,000, but if you really study that, that was 5,000 men, so probably looking somewhere in the neighborhood of fifteen to 20,000. And he disperses it to all of them, and, and the scripture says that they were filled. They didn't just get a bite. Jesus said, here it is, take all you want. Eat all you will. Be filled up. And Jesus, being a good steward of, of God's provisions, he says, hey, gather up the fragments so that none is lost. God's not going to waste. So they do. They gather up the 12 basketfuls. And Jesus and his disciples... As evening comes, Jesus puts them in the boat and says, hey, y'all need to go to the other side. I'm going to stay here. I need some alone time with the Father. He goes up on the mount all by himself. Well, the disciples get about three or four miles out into the sea, and this wave and wind, it, it comes up, and they're starting to get scared. And off in the distance, they see Jesus walking on the water. And they're afraid, and he says, hey, it's I. Don't be afraid. And they welcome him, welcome him into the boat, and the, just suddenly they're on dry land. 
And that's where we pick up in verse 22, chapter 6 of John, if you put it up on the screen. It says, on the following day when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there except that one which his disciples had entered and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. Next verse. However, other boats came from Tiberias near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. So they, they were there. They, they had ate the bread that God had given. Now I want to talk about that bread real quick. Bread is, is essential to life. I mean, all throughout the biblical times and all throughout our culture, you know, we talk about bread, we talk about food, right? We're talking about feeding our physical bodies. And Jesus has, has given this bread to all these people. But that bread is special. That bread sustains life. Not just physical life. You know, we, we come today that so, so that we could see with our spiritual eyes, right? Right? Well, let, let's go ahead and start focusing on that spiritual and that, that spiritual aspect that Jesus is going to be talking in. Next verse. It says, When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. Next verse. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves you were filled. So they start asking Jesus some questions. You know, hey, when did you get here? I mean, they seen him, they seen the disciples leave him on the shore. They knew that he didn't get in the boat. And they said, how? When did you get here? They didn't ask how. That, that kind of stuck with me. I thought, you know, well, I wouldn't have been worried about when he got there. I'd been worried about how he got there. You know, I'd have wanted to know that, first of all. But they didn't. They, they, they thought, well, when did you get here? And then they, we get the reply from Jesus, and he, he says, well, you know what? You're really actually seeking me because you ate that bread that I gave you in the wilderness. Out in, the, out in the desert. That's why you're following me. Not because you've seen the signs and the wonders, but because you were hungry. He says, but it was your belly that was hungry, not your spirit. You know, he's, he's kind of pointing to their, their physical state there. He says, look, you're just following me for an easy meal. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, sometimes we follow Jesus Christ because we want all the blessings that go along with it. You know, all the, all the things that he promises and says, you know, hey, I'll take care of you. Everything's going to be fine and dandy. And, you know, that, that's not what he's promising. He wants us to follow him because he is the Savior of the world. He wants us to follow him because he died on the cross for our sins. He wants us to follow him because he is the only way back to the Father. Not because he can give us some bread to eat. See, these people were, were following after him because they saw an easy meal. They said, hey, this is our meal ticket. He, he can just make bread appear out of nothing. We won't have to work anymore. So I want you to ask yourself a question this morning. Why are you following Jesus? What is your motivation for following Jesus? Is it so that you may receive some bread? You know, just an easy meal? Or are you following because of who he is and what he's done for you? And I'm not talking about just the, the daily provisions. I'm talking about him dying on the cross. Him forgiving you of your sins. The shedding of his blood. 
You know, why are you following Jesus Christ? Next verse. Jesus tells me, he says, Do not labor for food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. You know, Jesus is concerned about our spiritual well-being. He's not telling us to be lazy here. He's not telling us not to get up and go to work because he tells us in his word, he says, if a man does not work, he does not eat. He's not, this is not a call to be lazy. This is a call to prioritize our life. What is more important to you is it more important to you to make sure that your belly is full? Or is it more important to you to make sure that you are following Jesus Christ and his teachings and being obedient to God? Where are your priorities at this morning? I think sometimes we, we get lost in this world thinking that, hey, you know, I got all this stuff to do. I, I got to make sure that I provide for my family. And hey, that's, that's honorable. God tells us we need to make sure that our families are taken care of. But is that your top priority in life? I hope not. I hope God, seeking God and seeking Jesus Christ is your top priority in this life. That spiritual food, that food that, that leads to eternal life. That's what, we're need, that's what we need to be seeking this morning. Go to verse 28. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, Matthew 5, 6. Yo, know, Jesus is teaching the Sermon on the Mount, and these are the, part of the Beatitudes, and he says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. You know, he says, hey, if you're hungry, if you're thirsty... He says, if you're spiritually hungry and you're spiritually thirsty, I will take care of that. He says, I will fill you up. I will give you all you can stand. I will give you all that you can hold. But labor for that which leads to eternal life. Now I want us to think about that. Labor to that which leads to eternal life. And we're going to talk about what the work of God here is in a minute how he wants us to labor. It, 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 I think it will open your eyes. So go back to John 6, verse 28. I didn't give it to you, okay. I got it right here. Then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? You know, I think a lot of times in our human Nature, we, we want to work for our salvation. We want to say, Lord, what can I do so that I can earn my place in your kingdom? You know, we have this willing desire to want to work. We don't want to just take the free gift that is given us. We want to work for it. We got to do something for it. We can't just have it for, for nothing. You know, my daddy taught me I got to work for everything I get. So they're asking him this question, hey, how can we do the work of God so that, we can, so that we can have this eternal life that you're talking about? You know, sometimes I think we, we get caught up in thinking that same thing, that, hey, I need to, I need to do all I can to make sure that, that I do enough to get in. Now I want you to listen to how John, or, uh, Jesus responds to this question. And it's perfect, just like it always is. When Jesus speaks, it's perfection. Verse 29. Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God. So I want you to pay attention. This is the work of God. If you want to do the work of God, open your ears. That you believe in him who he sent. That's our labor. That's what we have to do. We have to believe in Jesus Christ. We have to believe that he is the Son of God. We have to believe that he lived a sinless life and that he died on the cross for my sins. That he has paid the debt that I owed. I have to believe that he is enough. That his sacrifice paid the price of my sins. I have to trust in him for my salvation. I have to believe that he is the one that, 
that reconciles me with God. All I have to do is believe. He says, you can't work for it. You can't earn it. You ain't good enough. Your righteousness won't cut it. He says, if you, if you really must claim that you're working, he says, just believe in me. He says, but, he said, you know, really that's not yours either. He says, because God has given to each man a measure of faith. He says, you can't even claim that before you get too boastful. He says, you can't work for it. The work has already been done. The grace has been supplied. The gift has been given. All we got to do is receive it. That's what he's telling these people right here. He says, believe in me, the one that God has sent. That is God's work. That's how we labor for those things that lead to eternal life. It's, it's trusting in him in every moment, in every situation, in everything that comes your way, trust in him. That's what leads to eternal life. When we start believing him in every situation, we take this book and we dig in it. We read it. You know, the word became flesh. We find out what he teaches. We find out what he says. We start living by his word. When we live by his word, we trust in him. How many of us trust him in every moment, in every situation? How many of us do exactly what this book says? I know I don't. I fall short. I fall short often. And I would dare to say that you do too. And he says, that's not okay. He, he tells me that that sin is not, not right. It's not good. It's not acceptable. He says, but when you find yourself in sin, he says, repent. Come to me, and I will be faithful and just, and I will cleanse you of all unrighteousness. So if we find ourselves not laboring for those things that lead to eternal life, he says, believe in me. Trust me. Believe that I can forgive you. Go to Ecclesiastes 9 through 14 real quick. Yo, know, I understand that, you know, Solomon was a very, very wise man. And Ecclesiastes is kind of a different book. He talks all about the vanity of life, how useless it is to, to live under the sun. You know, how all these things are, you know, profit nothing. And I, I understand that, but I want us to look at verses 3, 9 through 14 with a spiritual eye. He says, what profit has the worker from that which he labors? You know, in a worldly standpoint, the laborer, he don't get a whole lot. He gets some breadcrumbs at the end of the day. He gets to feed his belly and what? Tomorrow he wakes up and he's hungry all over again. I get that. But I want us to look at it from a spiritual standpoint. He says, what has the worker, what profit has the worker from that which he labors? Next verse. I have seen the God-given task which the sons of men are to be occupied you know, God gives us work to do here, right? We have to labor and toil for our, for our food. Now, God gives us the ability. He grants us the wisdom, and he, he grants us the knowledge and the, the health to go out and to work and to do these things. The provisions are from God. But he gives us certain tasks to do within this earth. 11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into their hearts except that no one could find out the work that God does from beginning to end. You know, God has planted forever in man's heart. It's, we have this overwhelming desire to want to live forever. We want to be immortal. 
We want to live forever, right? It says that God put that in our hearts. We want to, we want to strive for that. We want to work for that. That's natural. That, that wanting to live forever is natural. Verse 12. I know that nothing is better for them than to rejoice and to do good in their lives. See, now Solomon's talking about, hey, you might as well just live it up all you can because this is, this is all you're getting. But I want to look at it from the spiritual aspect. You know, in that verse number 9, he says, you know, what profit does the worker get for all his labor? And now he's telling us to rejoice, to do good in our lives. You remember the work of God? It's the labor for those things that lead to eternal life. Rejoice in that and do good. If we follow God's word, what are we going to do with our lives? We're going to do good. We're going to love him above all and we're going to love our neighbor as ourselves. We're going to be doing good with our life and we need to rejoice in that. We need to trust him in that. Verse 13. And also that every man should eat and drink, enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. I want us to look at that real quick. It says that every man should eat and drink. Who do we eat and drink from? As a Christian, I hope and pray that you are eating and drinking from Jesus Christ. The one who has laid his life down for you. His body was broken. His blood was shed so that we could have the remission of sins. We are to eat and drink of that and enjoy the good of all his labor. It's the gift of God. It's the grace of God that he has given us. If we don't enjoy that as Christians, we've got a sad life. I want to rejoice that Jesus Christ died for me. I want to proclaim it. I want to sing it to the rooftops. I want to follow his teachings. I wanted to obey his every command. And Jesus says, hey, if you love me, you will obey my commands. You'll be, you'll be obedient to me if you love me. That's his gift. Eternal life. Through Jesus Christ. Verse 14. I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Hey, when, when, when we come to Christ and he saves us, it's forever. It's not for just for a little while, but from now on, all through eternity. That, that eternity that, that God has placed in your heart, that desire to want to live forever, he says, it can happen, but you got to come to me. You got to come to Jesus Christ. That's what he's telling us. You got to recognize who he is, what he's done for you. It says nothing can be added to it and nothing taken away from it. God does it that men should fear before him. You know, do we really fear God? I would dare to say that we don't truly fear God. If we truly feared God, then we would keep his very word because we would be so fearful of what what the consequences would be. We don't understand true wrath, the wrath of God. We really don't. We, on the flip side of that, we don't truly understand the love of God either. But I want us to, I want y'all to see Jesus Christ revealing himself this morning. Don't just listen to my words, but listen to the Holy Spirit inside of you. What is he telling you this morning? Is he got your heart, heart knotted up inside saying, trust me. Trust me. You know, that's the way he does me most of the time. If it weren't for his Holy Spirit, I would be way off somewhere. But that Holy Spirit guides me back, keeps me on that right path. Let's go back to John 6, verse 30. Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? 
what work will you do? Wow. He just fed 20,000 people with five loaves and two fish. Now they're like, now what are you going to do, big boy? What are you going to do? About, you know, what are you going to show us now? 31. Our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So they're, they're throwing up their forefathers up in the face of Jesus and says, hey, Oh Moses here, he fed them some bread out in the wilderness. He said, what are you going to do? Jesus said, well, I'll, I'll explain. Let's go to the next verse. It says, then Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. Jesus says, first of all, let's, let's get something straight. Y'all hold, hold Moses high and mighty, but he says, He's not the high and mighty. God is. God gave you that bread. And God has sent you a true bread. A bread that does more than just sustain physical life, but sustains spiritual life. You know, that, that bread that your fathers ate in the wilderness, in the desert, he says all that was good for was just physical life. Nothing else. He says, but the life that, or the bread that my father sins from heaven. He says, now that, that's good for spiritual life. He said, that's good for everlasting life. Next verse. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. That's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came from heaven. He was sent here by the Father to give us life. Life everlasting. Life more abundantly. He says, are you listening to me this morning? Are you trusting me this morning? Are you taking of the bread and eating this morning? Are you, are you striving and working for those things that lead to eternal life? You know, over in, I didn't give him this scripture, but over in Matthew 6, I think it's verse 33, he says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all his righteousness, and these things shall be added to you. Are you seeking his righteousness this morning? Are you seeking his kingdom? Verse 34. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. See, they're, they're still thinking in that physical sense. They're like, well, look... Where's it at? Let me have some of that. Are we caught up living in this natural world and the things that are in it? Or are we living by the Spirit? Are we walking by the Spirit? You know, that's what Jesus wants us to do. He wants us to walk by the Spirit. He wants us to see the spiritual things in this life. That's how we see Jesus is with our spiritual eye. Next verse. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. I want that phrase, I am. When he said, I am, they said, <gasps> He said, I'm Yahweh. He said, I am that covenant. He said, I am the one that Jesus, or that God has spoke about, that has been prophesied about. He says, I am the Messiah. I am Jehovah. I am Yahweh. When he said, I am, they knew exactly what he was talking about. Because he just called himself God. He says, I am God. He says, I am the one. The bread of life. Now, if you think back into that story where he fed the 5,000, he took some, some dead bread and some dead fish, and he multiplied it. And he used it. To sustain life. So Jesus Christ died on the cross. That body was broken and, it, and that blood was shed and it was dispersed so that many could live. I want, I want you to think, I want you to really think about that. 
His body and his blood has been shed and dispersed so that many should live. He is the bread of life. He is the one that sustains us, not just physically, but spiritually, more importantly, spiritually. You know, the, the hunger in our bellies, those hunger pains, those, I mean, that gets you motivated. They'll get you up out of the recliner. They'll get you to the refrigerator. They'll get you digging around looking for something. But you know, I've had to make a choice in my life. Would I, would I rather waste my life seeking the things of this world? Or would I, would I rather seek the spiritual things that lead to eternal life. You know, God says, hey, if you'll seek me, these things will be given to you. The basic needs, God's got. You, got, you just got to trust me. Do you want the world, or do you want the kingdom of God? I mean, that, that's, that's our choice. You know, this is the physical versus the spiritual. The seen versus the unseen. And he's telling them, he says, hey, I'm right here. If you want the kingdom of God, he says, I'm standing here. I'm waiting for you. Go to verse 36. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. You know, how many times have we seen God? How many times have we seen him in this world? through his creation, little babies being born, the wind blowing, the rain coming, the sun shining, the, the clouds that cover us. How many times do we have to see him and not believe? I would dare to say that some of you are sitting there this morning and the Holy Spirit's telling you to believe. And you're saying, no, I can't. No, I don't want any part of it. Not right now. I'm not good enough yet. Well, if that's the lie that's in your head right now is I'm not good enough yet, you'll never be good enough. Because God says the only way you're good enough is to come to my son, Jesus Christ. And then you'll be good enough. He says, I will make you good enough. Quit believing the lies of Satan. And see Jesus for what he really is. A giver of life, a sustainer of life, a savior among all else. Verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. He says, hey, if you'll come to me, if you'll come and eat of this bread that I am offering you today, he says, I won't turn you away. He says, I've got plenty for everybody. I've got more than enough. He says, you won't be turned away at my table. He says, it's open to everyone. I died for everyone. Next verse. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Next verse. This is the will of the Father who sent me that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. Chris. You know, remember in that feeding of the 5,000, he said, hey, go, go pick up. Go pick up what's left so that none will be lost. Jesus Christ don't lose anything. If he's, if he's going to keep up with the little fragments of fish and bread that were left over, don't you think he's going to keep up with you? Don't you think he's going to keep track of you? I believe he is. And he says, but even more so, he says, I'm going to raise you up on the last day. He says, I'm going to resurrect you. He says, I'm going to make you new. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son 
and believes in him may have everlasting life and I will raise him up at the last day. You know, as, as y'all stand and, and Chris and them begin to sing, I want you to, I want you to listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. What is he telling you this morning? Has he revealed Jesus Christ to you in a, in a new way? Has he reminded you of who Jesus really is, that he's a sustainer, that he's a creator, that he's a, a giver of life, that he's a savior? I ask you, are you trusting him? Are you believing in him? Are you laboring for that which leads to eternal life? He says, if you are, he says, if you, if you are seeking my righteousness, he says, you'll find it. You'll get it. You shall have it. Are you hungry? Are you thirsty for righteousness? He says, I'll fill you up. He says, if you want to follow me, if you want to believe me, if you want to trust me, he says, I... He says, I will lead you down that path. He says, I'll walk down it with you. Yo, I, I would dare to say that, that some of us have some circ circumstances in our life right now that we are not fully trusting him in. You know, I find myself quite often sometimes trying to rely on my own power, trying to rely on my own hard work to get things done. And he constantly reminds me, he says, look, you can't. You can't handle this. You can't do this. And I have to come to him and I have to say, Lord, you know what? You're right. I'm wrong. I repent. I'm going to lay this down at your feet. I'm going to trust you. However this turns out, I believe that it's going to be for my good. You know, I've got to believe that, that it's going to work out to my good. He says it will. I just got to trust him in that. the 
cross, I surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you. Where you love ran, ran, and my sin washed away. I owe all to you. 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 take communion i want to read this to you real quick it's john 6 47 through 51 it says most assuredly i say to you he who believes in me has everlasting life i am the bread of life your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead this is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. So I want you to think about that as you come and, and you come to take Holy Communion. That precious bread that he took. And he said, this is my body given for you. And he broke that bread. He said, this is life. This is eternal life given for you that has been offered up to you. And he also took the wine and he said, this represents my blood, the blood that was shed for the remission of sins so that you could be forgiven, so that you could be reconciled back to God. He says, do this in remembrance of me. Well, let us pray. Dear Lord, as we come and we take this Holy Communion, Lord, we just ask that you bless these elements. Lord, that, th that they would feed us spiritually so that our eyes may be opened, so that we can see you in a different light so that we may have the strength and the courage to depend on you in every moment, in every situation of our lives, Lord, because without you, we have nothing. Lord, we recognize that. Lord, we ask that you bless us in this time, Lord, that we may draw closer to you and that you may draw closer to us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.